ladies and gentlemen, my name is Kurt. Welcome back to Kerbal Space Program. Once again, today I have planned a little bit of a departure from my standard Let's Play series, I guess you could call it, where I I guess I, I play as a as a Kerbal Space Program manager and trying to get people to, to different, not people, Kerbins to different places like the moon or building our space station or going to Duna, all that stuff. I noticed I've made an observation that since being available on Steam, Kerbal Space Program has gained a lot of new, a lot of new Kerbonauts, a lot of new people playing the game. And I've noticed on the Steam forums, on websites, on the Kerbal Space Program forums, in my own comments, that a lot of these new players, having been thrust into the game, attracted by its cute little green men and the promise of space exploration grandeur, uh, are a little bit lost and confused and perhaps a little bit frustrated. Obviously, this game is still in its early alpha stages. It's not a complete game yet. There are a few tutorials. I've ran through them and have found them to be uh, not the greatest. I mean, there's a lot of text, there's a lot of reading. Kind of kind of hard to, to get a handle on things. Also, my previous episodes uh, where I talk about tutorials or starting with a small spacecraft are in much older versions of the game that no longer apply. There's whole, whole new parts and ships and physics and things involved. So I figure today, get to the point, Kurt, today I'd like to do a tutorial. Maybe one of a few tutorials just on the basic way to play Kerbal Space Program. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do this in my standard Kurt Kerman world, where I do have a space station and people and robots and things landed on different planets, but we'll take it slow. I want to start it in my, in my world here. Uh, I guess I'll just keep it really basic. This is where you start. You have your, your VAB, that's where you make your rockets. That's your launch pad where you launch your rockets. Whoa, and you can actually... I'm, I'm just learning this right now. You can just click on the launch pad, choose a ship, and launch. I don't want to do that. Uh, this is your, uh, tracking station. Yeah, I guess I can click on it to show, but it basically is a way to, to see all of your in-progress ships. The game saves all of your missions that continue to, to go on in, in orbit and things like that, like the space station whatnot. Uh, and then here's your, your space plane hangar. I'm not gonna touch, I'm not very good at space planes, so I'm not even gonna try to do any tutorials about that. I still need to learn about space planes. But today I'd like to do a tutorial on how to just build your first ship and how to launch, basically. Uh, a few, I guess, warnings or uh, little, little nuggets of wisdom. The most fun I've had in this game was when I was first playing and first trying to figure out how to fly and how to create spacecraft. So, I, I'm, while I understand people getting frustrated not being able to play, that's actually the most fun you could possibly have, is, is making wild and crazy and totally unusable rockets, finding out that they are totally unusable and crazy and having them blow up on the launch pad, and then trial and error is really the way to play this game. So, I'd recommend giving yourself a chance instead of just running straight to the tutorials. Uh, also, you might want to look at some of my earlier videos, and that might make you question whether or not I'm the person you want to listen to when it comes to tutorials. But regardless, <laughs> I think I just told everybody to not watch my video. Uh, regardless, we're going to start in the VAB. We're going to make a very simple, very simple rocket, kind of taking from, you know, the early Gemini rockets of the U.S. space program. Uh, on the left here we have, before you can even start making a rocket, you need to choose your command module. You have a choice of... These across the top row are more for airplanes, so we're gonna skip those. We have a three-man command pod, the MK-12, and then the MK-1, which is a single-person command pod, very much similar to your, your, your Gemini capsules. Uh, Mercury, actually, Mercury capsules, the Gemini capsules, which you two people. Uh, this is a kind of a lander pod that holds two people, and then these all here are robotic missions, our robotic uh, little capsules. Basically, your ship needs a place to be controlled from, and we are just going to choose the MK-1. Very small, very simple. We're going to have one Kerbonaut. Uh, clicking with your mouse, 
lets you drag an object around. Scrolling with the scroll wheel is, is vertically up and down. You can you can make some very tall, very tall spacecraft in Kerbal Space Program. We're not going to get too crazy. Ours will probably be about this tall. Uh, and then right-clicking and moving around with your mouse will allow you to rotate the camera, which is all, also uh, not, something very helpful to know because there's going to be some times where you're going to be upside down and backwards trying to get that one part to fit. Uh, but anyway, we have our capsule. What's the next thing we need? Uh, basically, you're going to, assuming, assuming you want to bring your, your little Kerbonaut home, uh, on the left, all your parts, obviously, conveniently structured in different categories, your pods. You can add multiple pods, but the first one you choose is your main command pod, just keep that in mind. Uh, propulsion includes all of your fuel tanks, your rockets, also jet engines is in your propulsion. Control is kind of your active control parts, I guess you could call them. That includes SAS modules, I'll get to those, those are like autopilot, almost like autopilot, as well as RCS. That's a little bit confusing. I don't. I personally don't know that RCS belongs in this category, but it's there. Uh, your structural parts, exactly how it sounds. They don't really actively do anything, uh, but they do act as points of fixing different parts of your rocket together. Aerodynamic, wings and things like that. A little bit more helpful for your airplanes. Utility, Solar arrays, landers, wheels, and 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 uh, your what are these things called? Struts, landing struts, docking ports. We'll leave those alone for now. Like I said, we're making a very simple, very simple rocket. And lastly, science. These are kind of just cosmetic right now because they haven't included or created the campaign or career mode of the game. Uh, any science you do is merely for your own benefit. There's no missions or objectives to complete. But we have our first command pod. We've already chosen that. We want to bring our Kerbal home safely, and the way to do that would be with a parachute, which is in the utility category. Just need a very small parachute. Uh, I'm assuming one of the things that confuses new players and perhaps overwhelms them are all of these numbers. Like, look at, this is just a parachute, but we have stowed drag, semi-deployed drag, fully deployed drag, air pressure, total mass, drag. You really, you don't have to start doing math or anything like that. That's just a way for you to compare different, uh, different, you know, whether or not it's a, a rocket engine or a fuel tank or a parachute. Uh, you can tell that even though these two parachutes are different, they have the same amount of strength, I guess you could call it, the drag, when they're fully deployed. They also, you know, all three of these actually, even though they're different sizes, all three of these parachute configurations are quite literally the same as far as their effectiveness. This one is, is a little bit larger and has, as you can see, more strength, I guess you could say, drag capability to slow you down in different situations. But since we're keeping things simple, and because it fits, we're going to stick with the smallest parachute, and whoop, there we go, very nice. Our next step is going to be in the structural. We need a decoupler, that's the word, decoupler. We obviously at some point want to bring, like I said, our Kerbal Kerbonaut home, which means we just want to have the capsule return to the planet. The rest of the rocket, we don't care. It can crash into the ground because we will be done with it. Uh, so we want to choose a decoupler. There's many different sizes of decouplers. From the large to the very tiny, we're going to choose this medium-sized one because it fits the same radius as the rocket we're working with. There we go. You can also notice while I'm doing this on the right-hand side, this is kind of the uh, the sequencer, the sequence, the launch sequence, uh, I guess, list. That's we're gonna. I'm gonna tell you about that when we actually get a full rocket here. But that's gonna start building up as we add more parts. What I mentioned before was an SAS module. Um, sure, we can add this to this uh, this rocket. This is basically a flight computer. It's going, and you, I, I didn't even notice that before. There's like circuit boards and stuff on the textures on the top. That's pretty cool. 
basically a flight computer. It's not an autopilot. It's not going to launch and fly your rocket for you. But basically when you enable an SAS, it's going to do its best to keep your rocket pointed in the direction when you turned on or enabled the SAS, if that makes sense. I'll explain this better when we're actually launching the thing. Uh, but this is the advanced SAS, and this actually uses active control surfaces. So you either you either need a RCS system, you either need some winglets with controls, or you need a rocket engine with gimbaling for this to make any difference. If you don't have any of that stuff, this, this AASAS isn't going to do much good for you. Uh, there's also the standard SAS module. That's more of a passive SAS, not as... doesn't have as much strength. I really don't use these anymore, to be honest with you. There is, maybe I should consider start using these, but this is more of like a, a gimbal. Uh, the command module already has a built-in kind of gimbling system, I guess you could call it. That means you can torque and twist the capsule by using your WASD keys without having any sort of other active uh, control surface or SAS or rocket power or energy spent. It's just kind of built in. Helps with controlling the, the pod. So that's just what we're going to stick with. Uh, your, your advanced SAS pod uh, and then that's it. Obviously we need a rocket to launch. Uh, we need fuel for the rockets. So we are going to choose... That's kind of small. That's pretty gigantic. Uh, where is a good... This one's pretty good, I think. Your standard fuel tank. And like I said, there's a lot of statistics that you can see when you're rolling over the different fuel tanks. Uh, I mean, the main thing you're going to be comparing is the, the amount of fuel which you can see is listed under resources. There's liquid fuel and oxidizer. Uh, those two things burn at the same rate, so separating them like that makes it a little confusing for the beginner. But just know, the bigger the number, the more fuel it has. The heavier it is, which means it needs a bigger rocket to launch off the launch pad. Uh, but also, obviously, you have more fuel. You can burn for longer, which means you can go further distances, lift heavier loads, payloads, etc., etc. Uh, but we're just, like I said, going to choose this... FL T800 fuel tank. Uh, it's got a decent amount of fuel. It's slightly not not too large, but uh, but yeah, we're just gonna go with that. And of course, we need a rocket. And like I mentioned before, with the ASAS, the advanced SAS, it's going to need in order to actually do anything, it's going to need some sort of control surface. One of those would be a rocket with thrust vectoring. If you see in the stats for the rocket. If it says thrust vectoring enabled, uh, that basically means that the rocket will actually gimbal on kind of a, a 360 degree axis. And what's a way I can explain this? This actually, rockets actually do this in real life. Uh, let's say, let, like if you're trying to balance a pencil on your finger, the same kind of concept, all the weight is up on top. The, the gimbaling of the rocket will actually compensate and try to balance the rest of the rocket, like balancing a, a pencil on your finger, I guess. I believe there's only really one... Yeah, this rocket does not. It's a little bit more powerful, but it does not have thrust vectoring. Uh, so you just... I've accidentally chosen this rocket before when I, when I meant to have thrust vectoring, but the rest of the rockets, I believe all of them have thrust vectoring, which is helpful. Helpful. Uh, the solid rocket boosters, I believe, do not. Uh, but we're not going to touch solid rocket boosters just yet. So here, basically, is the most basic rocket. Well, probably not the most, but one of the most basic first rockets I can recommend trying. Once you've had your fun making something crazy and totally insane that blows up on the launch pad and you want to actually get into a flight. Uh, at this point, you might want to, uh, you know, your, your, your gut might want you to start putting wings and things on the side of things, but because we have this rocket that is thrust vectoring, we don't need that, because that's going to provide all the control we need. Uh, last but not least, since there is no launch tower out at the launch pad to hold us up, we're going to add a, a little tie-down, I guess you could call this, uh, what do they call it, the launch stability enhancer? 
it's pretty much a, a thing that holds your, your rocket in place. Not as important on a rocket this small, but it's, it's helpful to make sure that once we get to the launch pad, the thing just doesn't tip over accidentally. Uh, so we're going to add, for the sake of it, we're going to add two, and I guess this is as good a time as any to introduce the symmetry. Right here, symmetry mode, when you have a single dot, that means you only have one. There is no symmetry, so I'm just adding one of these items to the rocket. If I click that, left-click it, we now have two. So whatever object you're attaching to the side of the rocket is doubled. And you can either click or hit X on your keyboard to cycle through that. And it goes up to eight, I believe. We don't need eight of these things, obviously, so we're just going to add two for, for symmetry's sake. I'm just going to add them uh, right about there. And this is our first launch platform test. Uh, as you can notice in the launch sequencer on the right hand side, you can click and drag items around and whatnot. And this is going to be important when your rockets get a lot more complicated. With a rocket this simple, it actually, it arranged things properly the first time. Uh, but if things are out of out of whack, if you will, you're going to have to put a lot of thought into the sequence of which you want things to happen with your rocket. Obviously, first thing we want to happen is we want the rocket to fire. So we want that to come down here in the first stage. We don't want the parachute to deploy at the same time. So when I hit spacebar, spacebar is what enables the next launch sequence in the, the order of events. The next stage, if you will. When we hit spacebar the first time, in this situation, the rocket and the parachute are going to deploy at the same time. Which would be, uh, quite the disaster. So I'm going to remove the parachute to the next setup there. And I'm actually, what I want to happen at the same time, is I want these to let go of my rocket at the same time as I enable the, the, the launch. So that happens. You can do that separately, but that wastes fuel. So when I hit spacebar the first time, these little grapples will de deploy, or let go of the rocket, and I will be on my way. Uh, I do want to add another stage here, because this right here is your... decoupler? That's the word. I keep wanting to call them separatrons. That's something else in the game. But this is your decoupler right here, and it's very convenient that the part lights up when you hover over it. Uh, I want to be able to decouple my capsule and then, in a separate press of the spacebar, deploy the parachute. That is a very, very brief explanation of how this works. This is going to be very important later on when you make larger and more complicated multi-stage rockets, but this essentially is a single-stage rocket. We're probably not even going to get into orbit with this, because I orbit is another tutorial entirely. Uh, but here we go. This is what we got, and let's let's name our spacecraft. We'll call it the uh, the uh, Curbtorial. Oop, Torial. Like tutorial. Get it? The Curbtorial one. Save, and then we are going to head to the launch pad. And I had some. A previous launch, the debris was already on the launch pad, so we're going to clear that out of the way and let the game load. Uh, I'm going to... We have fairing Kerbin. Down here on the right-hand side is your, your Kerbonauts. When you hover over them, you get IVA or EVA. If you click IVA, then you go within the cockpit view, uh, which they haven't modeled all of the cockpits in the game quite yet, but uh, this, this one has a model, but it's a little bit difficult to fly from within this view. Hit, uh, hit C to go back to the previous camera. EVA will make them exit the spacecraft, and we don't want to do that on the launch pad. Uh, let me make it daytime and speed up time right here, or by clicking the uh, right carrot and left carrot, and or however you want to call it, the period and the comma key on your keyboard. Also controls, quick controls your, your fast forward and your your standard time warp, I guess you could call it. Fairy and Kerbin is a little bit concerned, but let me do a quick, quick rundown of your controls and what you're looking at here when you're launching. 
Uh, obviously, that's where we just came from, the VAB, but we're here at the launch pad. And the first thing you're going to notice is the big uh, nav ball down on the bottom here. This basically is an artificial horizon. And as you can see, the, the tip of the rocket is pointing straight up, so this is a, a representation of pointing straight up. And then there's north, east, south, and west uh, displayed right there. Uh, we also have throttle controls. Shift puts your throttle up. Control puts your throttle down. There's a G-force indicator. We're obviously sitting doing nothing on the launch pad, so there's just one gravity unit right there. And the indicator for your speed, which this changes depending on if you're talking about the surface of a planet or your orbital speed. Or if you're coming up to a target like you're going to dock to a space station, that will that display will change depending on the situation. Uh, and uh, that's more of a numerical readout of your heading, which corresponds with the 90, 180, 270 of the nav ball. Hope that makes sense. Uh, we're going to learn how to control the rocket. On the lower left, you can see our indicators for roll, yaw, and pitch. We're using WASD. W pitches down, D pitches up, A pitches left, or I'm sorry, yaws left, D yaws right, and then your roll is Q and E. Q and E. Something that uh, they don't really tell you in the tutorials, but if you click caps lock, those little indicators turn blue, and it's basically smooths out those controls, kind of dampens the fact that you're using a digital input with the keyboard and makes things a little bit more fluid. I always use that. That's a lot more helpful when you're doing actual planes, which require not freaking out at the controls. Uh, but those are your controls. Up on top, obviously, is your uh, altitude, altimeter. This tells you how much atmosphere you're in. This tells you your vertical speed or dropping speed. Zero means we're not going anywhere. And then there's some quick buttons for if you have landing gear, if you have lights, if you have brakes, we don't have any of those things. Uh, and an abort button, if, that is if you already assigned an abort sequence of events, which we did not, and that's a little bit more complicated. Uh, and uh, I think that kind of makes sense, does it not? We're trying to keep things simple. Uh, I guess I can also show you, get rid of that. Oh, I can't really... Oh, probably because the engine isn't on. I was going to show you the gimbling of the engine, but because it's not on, I can't do that. Sorry! Always before I launch, I like to come into the map view by pressing M and get myself set up for launch this way, because via this screen we're going to be able to tell what our orbit is and pay no attention to all this debris. If this is the first time you're going to be playing, you're not going to have all this debris everywhere. Uh, but by default, I'm not sure why, but by default when you come into map view you lose the nav ball. I like to keep that up because you can still control your spacecraft while in map view even though you can't see it. Like this view, when I click M again to come back here, you can't see the spacecraft. You can still control it if you have your nav ball up. So, I think, I think I've covered everything. Uh, really with the controls, like I said, with the controls and learning what pitch, roll, and yaw does to your spacecraft, uh, all that sort of stuff. Uh, learning about how much fuel you have left and how much fuel burns and what kind of throttle you need to launch your spacecraft. That all comes with trial and error, and like I like I opened this video with, the, the most fun you can kind of have in this game, nostalgically for me anyway, is, is all the times trial and error trying to figure out how to get a guy into space, and then into orbit, and then to the moon, and then make a space station, and all that fun stuff. So, without further ado, let's do a launch. It's going to be a suborbital launch. I'll just kind of run through the the sequence of events. Uh, it's, it's pretty much, like I said, trial and error once you get to this point, but uh, one of the the most frequently asked things that I see on the, the forums is, okay, I built a spaceship. I can't launch. How do you launch? Spacebar. Spacebar is the key to use to activate the next stage in your sequence of staging. And as our first stage here is to both simultaneously fire the rockets and drop our our little uh, I don't know what to call these 
launch pad arms, sure. <laughs> Tie downs, yeah, those things. Uh, when I press that is when all of that's going to happen. Make sure, before you launch, to have your throttle up. There have been many a times where if you ignite the engine but your throttle isn't up, you'll just fall to the ground. So, get your throttle up. I'm going to put it up to about 90%, maybe. You don't necessarily always need 100%, but uh, 90%, especially for a rocket this small. And of course, like all launches, you need to give yourself a countdown. The game doesn't do that for you. So, Faring Kerman, here in the Curbatorial 1, in 5, 4, 3, 2... Wait, 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 abort, abort! <laughs> I forgot one thing! Oh, sorry, Faring. Freaked you out, didn't it? Uh, the SAS! I forgot about the SAS. Remember we put this SAS module on here that's going to keep us going in the direction that uh, that we enable it on? By pressing T, we enable SAS. Turning it toggles it off again. He's excited to go. Fairing is like, come on, let's go! I learned how to turn on and off SAS. Uh, you can also tap F if you just want to turn it on momentarily. I rarely do that, to be honest, just because I learned how to do it with T. So before you launch, unless you want to go spinning out of control, turn on your SAS, and that's actually going to, because we turned it on while we're facing directly up, it's going to try to, with all of its power, during the launch, keep us on this same trajectory. So now, fairing, are you ready? Yeah, he's ready. Let's do this one more time. Let's restart the countdown. In five, four, three, two, one, spacebar. And lift off. And as you can see, even if I'm using my WASD key to try to take me off course, the SAS always fights and pulls me back to go straight up. Uh, while we're launching, you will notice fairing is freaking out, but also our liquid fuel is burning down. We can uh, probably throttle down a little bit. There's also this resources tab, which gives you a much more detailed view of your fuel. Like I said, the liquid fuel and the oxidizer, when you're using a rocket engine, drains at the same speed. So you don't really have to worry about running out of one before you run out of the other one. Uh, we are at 7,000, 8,000 meters. If we are trying to get into orbit, we do want to do what is known as a gravity turn at about 10,000. So I'm going to turn off SAS and just tap the... D, W-A-S-D, yeah, the D key, and kind of roll over on this 90 degree mark. What you're going to see is going to give us quite the, the arc in this view. And we're going to keep going up. And we're actually going to run out of fuel here, so I'm going to throttle down a little bit more. Like I said, this is going to be a suborbital flight. I'm going to try to make sure we actually get into space, which is at 70 kilometers. Yep. Perfect. Ran out of fuel there. But we're still on an upward slope, although we're still going through atmosphere, as you can see. Uh, so yeah, basically, if you're going to try to get into orbit, this isn't an orbital tutorial, uh, but you want to launch most reasonably towards the east on the 90 degree mark. So that's why I kind of tilted over at 10,000 meters uh, on the 90 degree, because I guess the science behind that is because the, the planet is rotating. We're actually using the the speed of the rotation and adding that, which makes it a little bit more fuel efficient to launch into orbit to the east. Same thing, you know, the space shuttle does that. Uh, that's the reason why Kennedy Space Center for NASA is in Florida, because it's closer to the equator. You get more of that little boost. You can launch to the west, or you can launch in a polar orbit, but that will be a little bit less efficient because you have to cancel out the fact that you're carrying the speed of the actual rotation of the planet. Uh, but regardless, our little guy is flying up. Like I said, space for Kerbal Space Program is 70 kilometers. We're going to reach that, aren't we? We are just reaching our apoapsis. Apoapsis is the tallest point in our orbit. Since we're not actually orbiting, that's all we have is an apoapsis, which is going to be... 71 kilometers, and once you hear that music, that means you are in space. You have gone to space today, Faring. You have gone to space. And even though I don't have any control surfaces, like I mentioned before, or SAS, or RCS modules, rather, 
the capsule itself, like I said, has a little bit of gimbaling power in it, so I can control myself. Uh, there's the roll. Obviously rolls left and right. Uh, pitch and yaw all works, even without having any sort of fuel. Uh, oh, and we're actually coming back down. Even without having any sort of fuel or anything. I'm going to turn on SAS at the back side, and as you can see, it tries to pull me back to where I actually turned on SAS. And I'm going to hit spacebar, which as you can see, the next thing in the chain of things to happen when I press spacebar is to activate the decoupler. Boof, with a bit of force. So now we just have our capsule coming back down. And uh, I the, the last thing I have to do is deploy the parachute, which we don't really have to do so soon. And it's actually not going to work because we're not we're not within the atmosphere. But Faring Kerbin is happy. Uh, that stage is spent. We don't need it anymore. It's going to crash into the ocean. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know that we're going fast enough. Uh, as you can see, we're falling. We're picking up speed. But once we hit the atmosphere or the thicker parts of the atmosphere, we're actually going to lose speed. And I don't know if we're actually going fast enough to to see any of the reentry effects. Uh, those are just visual effects. They don't actually cause heat or any damage to your spacecraft. They have not added that to the game yet. Uh, but if they did start, they would start in a little bit. Mm, they usually start about 30. No, I don't think I'm going fast enough. But we should be able to see... Yeah, our speed is not picking up anymore, and we're actually starting to slow down because we're interacting with the atmosphere. Uh, that stage, like I said, is going to crash. We're at 15 kilometers. I'm going to... Oh, there's some of the heat. Little bit of re-entry effects. Just a little bit. Just barely. At 10,000 feet, I'm going to hit spacebar. The chute is going to deploy. It's going to halfway deploy. That's kind of the drag chute. And then at, at least on Kerbin, in this atmosphere, at 5,000 meters, or 500 meters, rather, is when it's going to fully deploy. Uh, but there you go. It's pretty much out of your hands now. You can, I could have turned SAS off a long time ago. We're not in space anymore, and we're, we're under the, the control of our parachute. But uh, that is a very simple suborbital flight in Kerbal Space Program with a very simple rocket. I hope that this kind of helped. Uh, like I said, if you've seen any of my previous Kerbal Space Program videos, I might not be the most knowledgeable. Oh, that was just our other stage falling into the ocean. I'm not the most knowledgeable. I'm certainly not the most te technically adept at Kerbal Space Program. There's the full parachute deploy, and as you can see, we've slowed down much, much more because of that. Uh, but uh, I just felt it was... I don't know. Might be something you enjoy. Leave leave comments or leave a like if if you like this, and then I might perhaps for a next tutorial do orbital tutorial and try to share my knowledge about getting into, but then also adjusting and, and what to do within orbits and using your you know the different controls they've given us for that. Uh, I'm not sure. I just thought a little little service to the to all the new people playing Kerbal Space Program finding it via Steam, that this would be helpful. Uh, it's certainly something I didn't have when I started playing, but uh, but yeah. I will be also continuing my standard Let's Play of Kerbal Space Program. I think the next mission I wanted to undertake was putting a manned... Adjust your helmet. A, a manned uh, rover on the moon. That sounds like fun. Drive around, do some wheelies, jumps, jump off some, some sweet ramps, and, uh, <laughs> and stuff like that. So look forward to that. But until then... Simple splashdown is all we need. And there we go. Faring Kerman is back home. And at this point we could... He's happy. Look how happy he is. Whoa! At this point we could have him go on EVA. Whoa! <laughs> and then, uh, you know, he'll, he'll wait. Await rescue from the rescue chopper. There is no rescue chopper, by the way. We're just going to end the flight. Yes, end the flight. Uh, when you end the flight, it gives you a little bit of a readout of what happened during the flight. This one, obviously, 
went went as planned. You can see your statistics. That's the highest altitude we received. That's how it. Oh, it, uh, that I shouldn't have gone on EVA. The the mission clock resets when you go on EVA. Unfortunately, uh, our highest speed was just under a kilometer per second. Uh, we covered 115 kilometers. 5.5 G's. Yeah, interesting stuff. This is helpful if uh, if you have problems with your rocket and you can tell which part explodes before the other part, so you can kind of troubleshoot what what could be wrong. But uh, but yeah, thank you very much for watching this episode of Kerbal Space Program and and bearing with this tutorial. Hopefully it helped. Like I said, my name is Kurt. I will see you trying to figure out a dramatic way to end this episode. I will see you next time! Woo! Space Station!